I get you to turn with me to the Gospel of John. Gospel of John. John is perhaps my favorite of the four Gospels. And as you read the Gospel of John, there is something that we find here that we don't find in the other Gospels. John gives us a vision of Jesus unlike any of the other Gospel writers. When you read the Gospel of Matthew, what you find is that Matthew is informing us that Jesus of Nazareth is the long-awaited Messiah that Israel has looked for, that the prophecy of old had told them about. Mark is God's man of action, carrying out God's will, doing things. Luke records or points to Jesus as the Savior who came to seek and save the lost and is who, who is showing compassion toward the lost. But when you come to John, in John's Gospel, Jesus is revealed as none other than the eternal Word made flesh. The one who comes bringing eternal life to those who are willing to receive him. If you go to John's epistle, not the gospel, but his first epistle, 1 John chapter 1, John reveals Jesus to us there as well. He writes there, beginning in verse 1, he says, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at, and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested, and we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be complete. Now when you come to John's gospel, in what we call the prologue of that gospel, the first 14 verses basically of John's gospel, John takes us back to a time before creation. He takes us back to a time before angels, a time before the sun and the moon and the stars existed, a time before the planets, a time before this earth and all that we see that exists upon it. And what you see there in John's Gospel in chapter 1 and beginning with verse 1 are these words. In the beginning, he says, was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. What John says is that in the beginning, before all of these things, He was with God. He says He was God. And everything that you see around you, everything that exists, exists because of Him, because of the word but he doesn't stop there in this prologue he goes on because he tells us in verse 4 in him was life and the life was the light of men he tells us also that that light shines in darkness and he is the true light that enlightens every man He adds to that that even though he came into the world that he himself created, if you'll notice down in verse 10, he says, the world that he himself created did not know him. And not only that, verse 11, he said, nor did his own receive him. But then he adds in verse 12 that to those who did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. And even though he was eternal spirit what John writes in verse 14 is this the word became flesh and dwelt among us and he says and we beheld his glory glory as of the only begotten from the father full of grace and truth verse 17 he tells us that whereas Moses gave us the law He says, 
the Word became flesh, Jesus Christ, He brought us grace and truth. And then He makes this statement. He said, no one has ever seen God. But then He tells us that the only begotten God, or the, new, the King James says, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, whom He says is in the bosom of the Father, He said, He, He, has explained him or has declared him. That's the way John opens his gospel. As he talks to us about who the word is that has become flesh and this individual, Jesus Christ, and what he truly is all about. He is eternal. He is God in the flesh. He is the one that because of him everything exists. But then... As we go through John's gospel, what John does is he presents us with what he calls signs. And the signs, which are miracles that Jesus performs, that John records for us, are to help us see the glory of God in fleshly form. Tonight, in the little time we've got left, I'm going to quickly take you through. Some have listed seven signs. I don't know where the number stops but John starts and tells us first sign second sign and then from there you're just kind of left to figure out what the others are but there are some that different scholars have said this is one of the signs and this is as well so in your Bibles as you're walking along you may want to take notes because we're going to try to move quickly through these signs but the first one is found in John chapter 2 verses 1 through 11 Cana of Galilee is where Jesus finds himself there's a wedding feast going on. His mother is there, and Jesus and his disciples have been invited. You may remember the story. While the wedding feast is going on, suddenly the wine runs out. His mother comes to him says, they have no wine. He says, what does that have to do with me? She tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. He tells them, go, fill the water pots. There were six water pots. He orders them to be filled. These were water pots, according to, to John in verse 6, that were for the Jewish custom of purification. Each one of them could hold between 20 and 30 gallons. They go, they fill them, they bring them to the head waiter. He tastes it, and the water is no longer water. It is wine. Not only that, the head waiter goes to the, the bridegroom. He goes to the head of the, everything, and he says, we usually keep the worst of the wine for the last, but you've saved the best, the good wine till the end. Those that filled the water pots and the disciples and Jesus' mother knew exactly where it came from. And John says this is the beginning of his signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. You see, the manifestation of God's glory was seen in what Jesus was doing. And what John writes is this caused people to believe in him. The second one we find in chapter 4, beginning in verse 43. Jesus has gone, come back again to Cana of Galilee, and this time he's approximately 17 miles from the little city of Capernaum on the northeast coast, uh, or the northwestern coast of the Sea of Galilee. And there is a man that comes to him, a royal official, whose son in Capernaum is sick. And as we find there in verse 47, he goes to Jesus and he implores with Jesus. He begs him to come down and to heal his son because he's at the point of death. Jesus kind of rebukes him and rebukes the crowd because he says, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The man persists and Jesus said, go, your son lives. The man believed, as John writes in verse 50, what Jesus said, and he starts off toward home. Somewhere along the route toward home, some of, his, some of his servants meet him. And they come to him, and they tell him, your son is living. And he asks them, what time or what hour did he begin to get better? And they said, yesterday, about the seventh hour. And he realized that was the same hour that Jesus had said to him, go your son lives. And what John records for us is that his whole household believed. That was the second of the signs. 
and it caused people to believe that Jesus is who John says he is and who Jesus declared himself to be. The next one is found in chapter 5. This time Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's gone up for one of the feast days and there is a pool near to the sheep gate, a pool known as the pool of Bethesda or Bethesda and it's where a multitude of the sick have been laid out. There are blind people there and lame and people who are withered and, and as John says there is an angel that comes down and troubles the water and the first person that gets in the water is made well and there is a man who has been there and has been ill not necessarily that he's been there but he's been ill for 38 years he's lame and Jesus comes along and he asked him do you want to get well and the man basically explains to him that I have no one to put me into the water and every time the angel or the water is troubled and I try to get in someone beats me to it and so Jesus says to him get up pick up your pallet and walk and John records that immediately the man became well he picked up his pallet he began to walk you see people believed because they saw what Jesus did in John chapter 6 we find another one beginning in verse 1 and this is the only miracle of Jesus that is recorded in all four Gospels this time it's about six months after this previous one that we've just read about and Jesus and his disciples are on the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee a large crowd has followed him because they see the signs that he's been performing on those who are sick and Jesus goes up on the mountainside and sits down with his disciples and he sees the crowd coming toward him and he turns to Philip and he says where are we to buy bread so that these may eat verse 5 Philip is incredulous he says 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient to feed everyone and for them just to receive a little. Andrew says, there's a little lad here. He has five barley loaves and two fish. But what, what are these among so many? Jesus had the people sit down and John tells us there were about 5,000 there. He takes the loaves, he gives thanks, and then they begin to distribute them to the people. He does the same thing with the fish. And John tells us that the people eat everything they want. They are satisfied, and Jesus says, go back and, and collect what's left over, the fragments. And John records that they take up 12 basketfuls of fragments. 12 basketfuls from five barley loaves and two fish. John writes in verse 14, Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, Truly, this is the prophet who has come into the world. Well, they were thinking back to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, where Moses had told the Israelites in the, in the plains of Moab that God was going to raise up a prophet like unto himself. This is the prophet. This is the one. Look at what he's done. Another sign is found in the next few verses, beginning in verse 16. Right after this had happened, as it was moving toward evening, the sun was beginning to set. Jesus sends his disciples away, according to the other gospel writers. But John simply tells us they get in the boat and they start rowing to the other side. Jesus himself goes up in the mountain, as we're told by some of the other writers, to pray. As the, they're rowing the boat, the wind comes and begins to work against them. And they're not making much headway. And John says when they had gone about three or four miles, suddenly in the distance they see it's Jesus walking on the water to them, but they become afraid. And Jesus simply says to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Now this is the same instant that the others tell us about in which Peter asked Jesus, if it's you, bid me to come to you on the water. 
and we know what happens there. But John doesn't tell us all of that. All John tells us is that as soon as they took Jesus into the boat with them, they were at the land to which they were going. Now remember, John had said we'd made it about three or four miles. It was some seven to eight miles across the Sea of Galilee. So there was another three to three and a half miles to go. And yet when Jesus was taken into the boat, he says immediately, we're at the place where we were going. I have no idea how that happened. Don't know what Jesus did to transport them suddenly to the land that they were seeking. But it was a sign. It was a miracle. It was something that didn't normally happen, and it was evidence of who this man was. In chapter 9, we find another one. There's a man that's been born blind. Jesus and his disciples are walking through the city of Galilee. He sees a man that's been blind from birth. The disciples ask him, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's been born blind? Jesus said, neither. It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And so Jesus stoops down, spits into the clay, makes some spittle out, or takes a spittle and makes mud out of it, puts it on the man's eyes and says, go, wash in the pool of Siloam. And the word Siloam, by the way, means scent. He does. When he comes back, he can see. But by this time, Jesus has gone away. And there's a great discussion that arises over whether this is the same man that, as they say, used to sit here and beg, verse 8. And when it is realized or discovered that he is the same man, then the next question is, okay, how is it that he now sees? And he tells them what Jesus had done for him. Then they take him to the Pharisees. The Pharisees are upset because, well, this was done on the Sabbath day. You don't do work on the Sabbath day. And so then it is a discussion that arises and an investigation about why this man did it, who this man is, was this man a sinner, you know, we, and all of these things. And the result is that they end up putting this man that's just been healed out of the synagogue. Jesus learns about it, and Jesus comes back to this man. And he asked him, do you believe in the Son of Man? This man who had once been blind says, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? Realize he's never seen Jesus because he was blind when Jesus did this for him. And Jesus simply said to him, You have both seen him, and he is the one who is talking with you. But I want you to notice what John records in verse 38. John says, And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. John wants us to know that is, this is to be our response toward Jesus as the Son of God. Worship. Because of who he is. The last one I want to share with you tonight is found in chapter 11. It's one that you're so very familiar with. Jesus and his disciples are somewhere on the other side of the, the, the Jordan River. And there's a little town of Bethany. And in the town of Bethany there are three friends of Jesus. There is a, a brother by the name of Lazarus and his two sisters, Martha and Mary. Lazarus is sick. Martha and Mary send word to Jesus that Lazarus is sick and they're expecting him to come. And Jesus loved them. Don't get me wrong, he loved them, but he stayed two additional days where he was at and finally decided to go. The disciples were afraid for him because the Jews were looking for him. They wanted to do him harm. And Jesus tells them that Lazarus has died. They go back, and when they get to this little town of Bethany, it is made plain that Lazarus has been dead for four days. He's been in the tomb that long. Upon hearing that Jesus has come, Martha comes out to meet him. She says some things to him about, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus tells him that he shall live again. And she says, I know he'll live again at the last day in the resurrection. And Jesus makes the point, I'm the resurrection of life. He talks about the fact that that person who believes in him will live even if he dies. And then after that, she goes and gets her sister Mary and brings her out. She says the same thing, Lord, if you'd been here, he would not have died. And there's a, there, there are those that have come from Jerusalem to console her, and they're all weeping, and Jesus is deeply troubled, and he asks, where have you laid him? They said, come and see. And the shortest scripture in all of the Bible says simply Jesus wept. But they take him to the tomb. And he says, remove the stone. Martha, wait, wait, Lord, 
He's been dead for four days. By now there's a terrible stench. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? And after praying to his father, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And you know what happened? He came forth. Grave clothes and all, he walked right out of that tomb. And Jesus commanded them to unbind him and set him free. And John records for us these words in verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. Do you know why John gives us all these signs? Do you know why he includes these and, and other things in his gospel? Following the second appearance of Jesus to his disciples after he had risen from the dead, and, and following the, the, the recording of that, before John gives us the conclusion of his gospel, the very last chapter, chapter 21, in chapter 20, there in verses 30 and 31, John writes these words. He says, Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John included these signs so that those who would read this gospel down through the ages might come to believe that Jesus is exactly who he professed himself to be and whom John declared him to be. He is the only begotten Son of God, the only begotten from the Father. He is the Word that was made flesh. He alone has the power to meet us in our deepest needs and to soothe our sorrows. He alone has the power to give us victory over sin and death in our lives. He alone is the Son of God. He is the only one who gives us access to the Father. There is no other way to the Father but through Him. So the question tonight comes to you and me. It's the question that he asked Martha long ago. Do you believe? Do you really believe? Because that's what the gospel is there for. That's why John wrote it. So that you and I would believe. And so that we would respond to that belief and our lives would be different. Tonight, maybe you're here. Maybe for years you've struggled with believing. You've struggled with, what do I do with Jesus Christ? Well, John's statement to you would be, believe in the name of the Son of God. Confess that name. Turn away from that which has separated you from the Father and come believing in Jesus Christ and be buried with Him so that you can live. You can have eternal life and the Word become flesh can be life eternal for you. Tonight, Ray has selected a song for us. It is a song to encourage you, if you need to come, to come in obedient faith. The only thing that's holding you back tonight is yourself. No one here wants you to stay in your seat if you need to respond. Our plea to you is won't you come right now as together we stand and sing.